November 23rd of next year, 2023, will mark the 60th anniversary of the assassination of America's 35th president, John F. Kennedy. JFK was first elected to office in 1960, and by the year 1963, he had set the wheels in motion for his 1964 re-election. But the president needed the delegate-rich state of Texas to carry him across the finish line. So in November of 1963, a year ahead of his election, President Kennedy and his wife, First Lady Jackie Kennedy, made a presidential visit to the state of Texas, campaigning in cities like Fort Worth, Houston, and finally Dallas. Around 12.30 p.m. on that day, news agencies around the country were still featuring stories of his Texas trips and the remarks he was making on the campaign trail. President Kennedy denounced critics of his foreign policy today as prone to confuse rhetoric with reality on the second day of his Texas tour. That went out over the airwaves of NBC affiliate WLW in Cincinnati, Ohio. Ironically, that bulletin aired at 12.30 p.m., which was the exact time President Kennedy was shot. And that newscaster had no idea what was happening 500 miles south of him in the Lone Star State. Back then, reporters relied on wire services, which were like early versions of fax machines, to exchange information. So there was a much greater delay in sharing news versus today, where everything happens in real time on our smartphones. After the shots rang out in Dallas, and it was clear that President Kennedy was shot, Merriman Smith, a United Press International reporter, sent a wire that flashed in newsrooms across the country, stating that the president had been fired upon. Here is an audio excerpt of an afternoon DJ during his music shift, getting the news handed to him as it occurred. Now to Dogpatch USA, and before we get the proceedings underway, we'll have to stand by here just a moment. There may be something happening. There's a bulletin just handed me from Dallas, Texas. An unknown sniper fired three shots at President Kennedy, seriously wounded. Been shot. Who? Kennedy. President? Yeah. That last part was a real-time reaction from some of the radio station staffers who were on duty that day and gives us a glimpse as to how stunned Americans were when they heard the news that their chief executive had been shot. Bulletins continued to pour out of Dallas by accompanying newsmen with more preliminary details on the incident. Kennedy apparently was shot in the head. He fell face down in the back seat of his car. Blood was on his head. Mrs. Kennedy cried, oh no and tried to hold up his head. The only uh, indication we have that the president might be dead was the statement by Clint Hill, the Secret Service agent assigned to Mrs. Kennedy, who said he's dead when the president was lifted from the rear of the White House touring car and rushed to Parkland. The Secret Service agent mentioned in those clips was Clint Hill. Agent Hill was in charge of Mrs. Kennedy's detail and was there with the First Lady on that fateful day in 1963. In 1963, Agent Hill was only 31 years old, which makes him 90 years old today. The Kennedy assassination was part of the course of his career, which spanned five presidents that Agent Hill was responsible for protecting. Others included President Lyndon Baines Johnson, or LBJ, who Mr. Hill visited American Samoa with back in 1966. Also Presidents Ford and President Nixon. He joins us by phone now from his home in Belvedere, and we're talking about his career as a Secret Service agent for Mrs. Kennedy and the events surrounding the Kennedy assassination. So, Agent Hill, the first president you guarded, was that President Eisenhower? First, assignment, first protective assignment was Eisenhower back in, in the late 1950s. And then you get another assignment. You, the, um, this 1960 election happens, and you find out that you, because I, 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 I was reading your book, you were a bit disappointed that you would not get the JFK, the John F. Kennedy presidential assignment, Instead, you were assigned to his wife, Mrs. Kennedy. And can you tell us about when, what you first felt like whenever you got that assignment and found out that you were not going to be able to guard the president, but rather his, his wife? Well, I knew what uh, agents who had been with former first ladies uh, that I had witnessed did, and that Mrs. the agents that were with is Mrs. Eisenhower or Mrs. Truman, uh, they went to fashion shows once in a while. They watched the protective play Canasta. Uh, there wasn't anything interesting about what they were doing. And so I didn't want any part of that. I wanted to be where the action was 
and that had always been with the president. So I was very upset when they gave me that assignment, and uh, but I had to accept it. She really didn't want anybody there either. She didn't like the idea of somebody looking over her shoulder 24 hours a day. And so we kind of agreed to get along, even though we both wished we had some other assignment. And, and that is... Uh, it turned out that my assignment with her, because of who she was and the things she did and her, the attitude she had and everything, was by far the best assignment I could have ever wished for. And we're talking about your book, My Travels with Mrs. Kennedy, which covers 1960 and onwards. Particularly, though, now let's talk about 1963. Because that was an incredible year, I'm sure, for you. Um, for her, obviously, the loss of one of her three children and then... Um, she was. I, I read that she was so popular and well received all over the world. I mean, really, she was the first of her kind as far as first ladies and just how much appreciation that she garnered when, wherever she went. And it sounds like before the trip to Dallas to pick up Texas, because Texas was a tough state again, and there was drama down there uh, between Yarborough and uh, Connolly, and the president goes down there to kind of mend those fences. He brings Mrs. Kennedy with with him on that, I think, to uh, elicit more support because she was just always such a big hit wherever she went. You go down there as well, and you're on the detail, and the most iconic, very unfortunately iconic uh, photo probably of all time is the 1963 late November photo, and you're leaping onto the limo. Now, she is coming off of the limo after the shot is heard, and it looks like she is she's reaching for something, and you kind of see you reaching towards her. What's happening in that exchange? Well, when when I would get, got close to the car and started up on the trunk, there's a little platform back there for the agents to get up on their feet on. And she had gotten up out of her seat after the president got shot in the head. And a lot of material had came out of that wound from the head onto the trunk and off into the street. And she came up out of her seat and tried to grab some of that material. That's why she came up there. And she did manage to get some. She had a portion of his skull in her hands, uh, and she had blood all over her. Uh, and I got a hold of her, and I put her in the back seat, uh, and then lay up on top of the back seat over her and the president and screamed at the driver to get us to a hospital, which she did. And then you arrive at the hospital... She is there in the limousine and does not want to release the president to go to the stretcher. Can you tell us, because you played a pretty important role in as far as getting the president, who had just been shot twice, out of the, uh, out of the limousine and into the stretcher. Yeah, we, were trying, we, were, we had to move president, or Governor Connolly first because of the way the car was configured. The, Governor and Mrs. Connolly were sitting in what they called jump seats immediately in front of the rear, very rear seat. And the back of that seat, when it's occupied, is right up against the person who's sitting in the right rear seat, and that happened to be the president. So we couldn't do anything to help the president or get him out of the car until we removed Governor Connolly. Governor Connolly had also been shot. We got him out and put him on a gurney. And then it was, we are going to move the president, but Mrs. Kennedy wouldn't let go. So I pleaded with her, please, Mrs. Kennedy, let us help the president. I didn't even get a response. I pleaded with her again. I had been with her long enough, so I knew her pretty well. So I took off my, over, my a suit coat, threw it over the president's back so that, uh, and part of his head, so that nobody could see it, really, see him or the wound. And then when I did that, she let go. And we then uh, put him on a gurney and took him into Parkland Hospital. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the, the rest is, uh, is kind of history. But that moment really, I mean, that's a watershed moment, I think, because everything is just fine. It's a beautiful day. Uh, Mrs. Connolly turns her back, says, Mr. President, you can't say that Dallas doesn't love you. And then three shots ring out. The whole world changes after that. Um, and two hours later, you are taking 
what was once a very lively president back home to his children, the two infants, uh, in, in a casket. And, uh, I, I mean, it's just an absolute nightmare. It's like a Greek tragedy. And Mrs. Kennedy was so dignified in those following days there. But there are also t- things that we did not necessarily see. We didn't have a window in, we being the general public. While you were her assigned agent, what were things like behind closed doors uh, outside of the public eye? Can you share any anecdotes about that? Well, sure. I mean, she was having a very difficult time with this. And man, it's only normal. Uh, it was so sudden. I mean, when at the time the president got shot, she and the president's head were almost touching each other. So it was very, the the, in, the wound that killed the president was, I would say, six or seven inches away from the, from Mrs. Kennedy's head. So, I mean, it was that close. So she was really in shock. So in, in the hospital, uh, she stayed near the room that the president was in. They had the president in one trauma room and they had the governor in another. Mrs. Connie was waiting for to see what the results are for, for her husband, and Mrs. Kennedy waiting to see uh, what the results were for her husband. Uh, I knew that he was dead. There wasn't any question in my mind, looking at the wound and everything, because uh, there was a, a hole in his skull. I mean, uh, all the material, the brain material, had been removed, just blow it away. So there wasn't any question in my mind about what he was dead. There was blood all over the place, including me, Mrs. Kennedy, the car. And uh, at one point, I was there. And I was told to uh, require or ask by my boss to open a telephone line to the White House, get in touch with our, our bosses, and I did. And I told him to keep me on the line. And then the operator cut in and said, Mr. Hill, the attorney general wants to talk to you, and that happened to be the president's brother, Bobby Kennedy. So I said, yes, Mr. Attorney General, what can I do for you? He said, what's going on down there? And I explained it to him. He said, well, how bad is it? I didn't want to tell him that his brother was dead. So I just said, it's as bad as it can get. And then he just hung up. He knew then that his brother had died. Um, we then uh, had a little difficulty leaving the hospital because uh, state law in Texas uh, required an autopsy before you could move a homicide victim from the hospital without being uh, given that autopsy. And they came in, they wanted to stop us. We were going to go, go to the aircraft and fly back to Washington. Uh, we, we asked them how long that would take to do that autopsy there, and they said, oh, a day, maybe two. And we said, well, that's not acceptable. We're going back anyway. Uh, and so they then said, uh, please have a medical professional with the president's body through this entire transport series. Uh, and so we... I had volunteered the Admiral George Berkeley, who was uh, the president's military doctor there in the White House, and he was on the trip. So he, at that point, just stood, stepped in and was beside the president's body the rest of the way. I when see. we started to go out to the car, we, I had ordered a casket, and they had brought the casket so the hearse was there. And... Um, so they put the nurses prepared the body, put it in the casket. We were taking it out to the car, and Mrs. Kennedy was walking behind it, and I was with her. The the admiral got in the back of the hearse with that casket. So then I said to Mrs. Kennedy, "We can drive ride in this car right back here," and she said, "No, no, I'm going to ride in the back with the president." So she crawls in the back of the hearse. So I crawl in right after her. It got a little crowded in there with a casket, an admiral, Mrs. Kennedy, and myself. But we managed. And we get to Air Force One, which is at Love Field in Dallas. And uh, we offload the casket. 
We have to carry it up the steps to the rear door of the aircraft. The, uh, Air Force engineers had removed seats from the rear of the aircraft to make room for us to place the casket there. Uh, so we got to the top of the ramp, and then we discovered the casket was a little bit too wide. So we had to break the handles off the casket in order to get it in through the door, which we did. And then we took off for, well, we didn't take off immediately because uh, Vice President Johnson was on board. And information came back from Washington indicating the necessity to swear him in as the new president while we were still on the ground in Dallas, which occurred there on the ramp in uh, at Love Field in Dallas. And I witnessed that. And that is a, an incredible photo. Two hours before that photo, everything was fine and dandy. And then First Lady Jackie Kennedy, and you're there in that photo. Um, it, I, I've, I've seen that. That's a very famous photo. And she's standing next to uh, President, uh, President-elect President uh, LBJ, who's getting sworn in because, uh, you know, since the president is dead, he's the, uh, the the next person in line. So that was incredible. Now, you're you're living with this trauma, and I wanted to just go back to the book if I could. I, I did not know about this, and I thank you so much for sharing this, especially in a time, and what a remarkable time of life that you've lived, sir. Uh, you know, you just, you turn 90 this year, 91 next year. Um, you shared something about the PTSD, the post-traumatic, that you were dealing with this. And I've seen your interviews, too. I saw you pouring your heart out to uh, Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes. You know, you always thought, oh, my gosh, if I could have just gotten there a fraction of a second earlier, I could have taken that fatal headshot and you could have blocked it with your body. I've seen you say that. And in the book, you share with us how you tried to take your own life in the months that followed because of the guilt that you were you were dealing with. Yes, that's correct. Uh, It happened toward the end of the year 1963 in Palm Beach, Florida, where Mrs. Kennedy and the children had gone to spend Christmas and New Year's, which was an annual event normally with the president. But now he was dead, so everything was different. And she was so depressed, and the children were really missing their dad. And I was a witness to all that, and I had this sense that we failed. We, I personally had failed, and the service had failed. It bothered me so much that Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore, and I, I tried to kill myself by walking into the ocean at Palm Beach. I got in, and the water was up above my neck, and uh, the police officer grabbed me and pulled me out and saved my life. So I was only 31 years old at that time. Um, so I've had 60 years, almost 60 years of life since then. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mr. Hill, we're very grateful that you are are still with us, and I just think that you are a remarkable American, probably the greatest American uh, that is alive at this moment who has seen so much. You saw Pearl Harbor. You were eyewitness. You you fought in Korea. You were an eyewitness uh, to the Kennedy assassination. It sounds like you had a remarkable relationship with uh, the First Lady. You stayed on her detail for a number of years, and the presidential uh, Secret Service must have thought that you were incredible because you were President Johnson's Secret Service agent as well. I see that you came to American Samoa with him on that detail back in 1966, American Samoa, where we are doing this interview from. And just talking about your book, My Travels with Mrs. Kennedy, a lot of inspiration for this book and the pictorial accounts of your travels together across the globe A lot of that came out of an old trunk that you had laying around your house, which was full of a bunch of mementos. Around your house, which was full of a bunch of mementos. Can you tell us a little bit more about the trunk? Well, sure. The trunk that we found in my garage that I was pleading out to sell the house was a trunk I had used during the period of time I was responsible for Mrs. John F. Kennedy, Jacqueline Kennedy. And uh, on the top of the trunk, it was painted in big white letters, Clinton Hill, the White House, Washington, D.C. And when we were going through the house to clean it out to to decide what goes into 1-800-JUNK and what would be shipped to California, we Lisa came across this trunk. 
and she wanted to know what the history was of it. And so I explained to her that I had used that to transport material back in the Jacqueline Kennedy days, Mrs. Kennedy. And so she wanted to open it immediately. I urged her not to because I didn't know what might be on the inside. I hadn't seen that trunk for over 50 years, and I knew that it had been uh, the victim of a flood, and so I thought perhaps the inside was just all ruined anyway, whatever it was in there, but she insisted, and so I convinced her not to do it right then. We'd do it the next day. We did that. We came back with rubber gloves and black trash bags, and uh, we opened the trunk, and she had me videotape it, and she started pulling out things. And she'd pull out a uh, deck of unopened playing cards from Air Force One that we used to give away once in a while to people, or a Zippo cigarette lighter with the presidential seal, John F. Kennedy, or uh, JFK PT-109 uh, tie clips. Uh, things of that nature, and I said, well, see, I told you this is just junk in there. She said, this is not junk. <laughs> this is historical. So, so then we, she kept on going. I went into another part of the house, and she kept on finding things that turned out to get have me remember where I was at that time that picture was taken, who took it, what was going on, and it got to be quite a thing. Well, then in, when COVID hit, we were uh, required to stay at home, so we wanted something to do, so she suggested we write a book based on that trunk and the contents thereof, and so, which we have done, and now that book has been released by a uh, gallery section of... Simon & Schuster, and yesterday we were notified it's on the New York Times bestseller. Oh, congratulations. So that's we're very fortunate. We have four books out now. They've all been New York Times bestsellers. Hey, I just wanted to um, let you know that uh, I, I'm my mom uh, was a great admirer of yours. She uh, passed away last year, but she kind of got me into your... Um, she gave me as a gift uh, the book five days in November and that was back in 2013 when it first came out and that has since just spawned my interest in this so I can't tell you how uh, how happy I am to have you uh, have you on my program today well glad to talk with you I know that we're out of time with you sir but I just wanted to thank you for sharing your story with us giving us an access into this very critical time of hi history uh, the 1960s and uh, wish you all the best sir and I know that uh your, your lovely wife, uh, Lisa, played an important role in all of this as well, and I wanted to thank her, too. So we appreciate the, the time that you gave us today. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Please uh, greet all the people down there in American Samoa. All right. Uh, we've been, I've been there twice, and, uh, both time with the president. It was wonderful both times. Thank you very much. Uh, Agent Hill, God bless you, and uh, thank you again, and uh, all the best stuff uh, from us in American Samoa. Thank you very much. All right, bye now.